Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Ravi Hattisingh, who is actually over in my own stomping ground in Virginia on the other side of the country. How are you doing, Ravi? Great, great to be with you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, and Ravi has probably one of the most fascinating backgrounds uh, I've ever seen, to be perfectly honest. I've been doing this a long time now. Um, so Ravi's a descendant of India's first family, including um, the Prime Ministers Nehru and Gandhi. And his he was guitarist with Grammy-nominated Hanson. Who doesn't remember Hanson? What was, what was that song? Mbop was it? something like that. Anyway, performed at the White House, Madison Square Gardens, SNL, so many more, and later became a pilot, aviator, speaker, helping industry attract new student pilots. And 2015, the US State Department sponsored cultural programs in Russia, Indonesia, Iraq, and Lebanon. Uh, and what we're going to talk about today is uh, so there's a lot of talk at the moment about the about the great resignation and a lot of people are wondering kind of after COVID and going through all of this like um, what am I going to do next and and maybe what I'm maybe something I'm passionate about but I'm not getting that from what I'm doing right now or I really want to do something I want to really want to do what I'm passionate about but I don't know how to so this is what we're going to talk about how to pivot your passion into your profession. Um, so, Ravi, I'm sure there, you're getting lots and lots of people coming to you today asking you advice about this. Oh, I, absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, a, a lot of a lot of the conversation post COVID is really about this. And so that's uh, many of the questions that happened, because, in fact, during COVID, during the first lockdown, I was actually on a three week trip to the coast of Chile. And while I was there. The border closed. <laughs> I was no. there for six months. So what are you going to do when you're, you know, stuck on the Pacific Coast with a beautiful view for six months? I wrote a book, a book called Pivot. So, uh, and it was really about. Um, it's very autobiographical about the pivots that I've made. But the context really is in the pivot that we all had to make during this pandemic. Because as you just said, could, you know, today as well, people are still considering what's important in life, what how they want to spend their time, who they want to spend their time with and what they want to do, or what their legacies want to be. I mean, so many questions. And I think it's a positive thing because when we have this type of, you know, catastrophic event, yeah. for lack of a better word, that really shifts our mindset, it gives us all that opportunity to reinvent ourselves and, and to reinvent, uh, uh, you know, the way we want to do things and the way we want to lead our lives. Yeah, and then it's fascinating that uh, what you mentioned about Chile because my, uh, my brother and his wife, who's Peruvian, they actually moved from Ireland to Peru just before COVID and then went into like a two year lockdown where they, you know, there was a times they couldn't even go out on the streets. So they could, they had one day a week each to go out to the grocery store. So it was, so um, I should say to him, hey, why didn't you write a book? Uh, but anyway, he's got two toddlers, so I can't blame him on that one. Um, so, so uh, you know, often people, you know, you'll get advice. And I think obviously from a lot of people, sometimes you get advice saying, ah, oh, you know, that's great. It's great that you have that passion and everything. But can you really turn it into a lucrative career for yourself? But I think nowadays there are so many tools and resources at your fingertips that you can do things today that you could never do, like even 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, you know, it's somewhat of a luxury to be able to pursue your passion and build a career out of it. I mean, many people don't um, have that opportunity, or at least they, they don't think they have that opportunity. They haven't created that opportunity, perhaps. And that's the way I always look at it, is, is creating opportunities in order to do that. And while I say it's a luxury, um, it's also hard work. <laughs> There's no way around it. It's not easy to pursue your passion. But then again, you know, it's not easy to do a lot of things. <laughs> So I, yeah. and my background is in music and people used to say, oh, but it's such a hard life being a musician. Well, talk to a banker right at, after 2008. You know, it's, we are, yeah. they're, they're, it's hard to do many things. So you might as well do what you love because you're going to have to put in the effort and the time. And I do believe that ultimately uh, persistence prevails. And it's not just being persistent, but it's being persistent with the attitude of lifelong learning, a willingness to fail, a tolerance for risk. All of those things have to factor into it. But when you're doing what you love, you 
generally have a higher tolerance for risk. You generally have a greater willingness to fail. And you generally have a stronger desire to learn because you're pursuing your passion. So think about it, put all those things into place. Well, you've got a maybe a pretty good formula for success. Yeah, and I read somewhere yesterday, what is it, opportunity, opportunities come disguised as hard work, which is why most people miss them. Yeah, you know, um, I think that's very true. And, you know, actually in my book, I talk about how luck has played into everything that I've done, but how my definition of luck has changed throughout the years. You know, it started with, I was lucky that I had parents that supported me. It's a very important thing as a, as a child who had a passion and wanted to pursue a career in music. But then, you know, the Seneca or Oprah made it more popular to say luck is the moment when preparation meets opportunity. And I realized that is so important to be prepared. Uh, my old guitar teacher taught me that it's better to be prepared and not have an opportunity than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. And these are things that always stuck with me. So I was always trying to make sure that I was prepared regardless of whether or not the opportunity presented itself. And you know what? The opportunity usually did because when you're prepared, you recognize the opportunity. When you're not prepared, well, that same opportunity is there. You just don't see it. And then uh, sort of to your point, my uh, current definition of luck is along the lines of Thomas Jefferson. Here I am, not far from uh, Monticello. Yeah. And um, Thomas Jefferson's uh, philosophy on it was, you know, the harder I work, the luckier I am. And yeah. I believe in that a lot. You know, it's, if you work hard, things start to come back to you. and. and and also, if you're passionate, people start to recognize that passion and they want to help you because you can't do it alone. So uh, one thing that I think we all suffer from sometimes is like we're not sure what we're passionate. Maybe what we think we're passionate about a bunch of different things. And we so maybe we flip from one to the other. How do you how do you find the discipline to look and say, OK, this is the thing I'm really passionate about and this is the thing that I really can do? And I'm willing to put in the work for because I, I feel like sometimes we think we're passionate about things, but we're not really deep down. You know, I think uh, maybe that's true, or maybe we are passionate about things, but we're too afraid to to pursue it, uh, and so we don't recognize maybe how passionate we are. And if, if we didn't have those filters and those barriers, maybe we would say, "This is what I want to do." The other side of that is, "This is what I want to do now." doesn't mean that that's going to be true in five years. And that's okay too. We can have a business plan or a life plan, an education plan, however you look at it, that is a journey. It doesn't have to just be a destination. And, and I think when you look back at my career from being a musician and fortunately being very successful in that, then pursuing my other childhood passion, which was learning to fly airplanes and you know having a, a, an amazing career in aviation. And then um, due to an inner ear infection, which you know, I could no longer fly airplanes. I had to pivot again. And I just knew that travel was something that I always enjoyed. So I wanted to do something that was global, which led to, you know, working and uh, representing our country as a cultural diplomat for the State Department. Nothing I ever thought, by the way, as a child would be on my resume. I can't say it was a passion. I never thought, wow, I'd love to be in government, even though I came from a political family. But tra travel, I love to see the world and I love cultures. And this opportunity was one that enabled me to do that. So I think it's okay. The lesson there, I think, is that it's okay to have multiple passions. And I think uh, part of the success in life is about finding your niche. And yeah. your niche is often at the intersection of multiple passions. So, you know, I did find a way to, you know, in music, it was music. In aviation, I was known as the flying musician. Music you know, pursued me in cultural diplomacy. Uh, I'm the guy that does the cultural music programs around the world. So there's that common thread of music throughout because that was the first, that's, that's where my, I think my talents and strengths lie. But I was able to weave that through my other passions, which enabled me to create a niche, a niche market and develop a business plan around that. Yeah, there's a couple of things that you said there, Ravi, that you just want to pick up on. Uh, first of all, I think what you said is, yeah, you don't you can have a passion for something now it can change uh, or or the direction can change i think sometimes we just we set this big goal and we just think everything has to move towards that and and we don't we don't look at the incremental steps along the way and the other thing you mentioned there which i think is really interesting too is sometimes you do things that 
eventually lead to something, but you've got to take the path. So maybe the, the first path doesn't lead exactly where you think it should, but ultimately those paths lead you places if, if you're open to that. Yeah, you know, if you reverse engineer my career, it makes perfect sense. But if you look at it forward, it makes no sense. Uh, you would never really see the logic to it. And the reason for that is because uh, the logic lies in our own interest and our own humanity, and we create the logic. So when you look backwards, you say, okay, I can see how one thing led to another and led to another and led to another. But unless you're open to it in the first place, you don't see those opportunities to go down the long and winding road. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, you mentioned um, in your recap of what I said, that uh, that passion can change. Um, I, I would say this is where uh, I define in the book the difference between change and pivot, um, because pivot is not a complete change. Pivot mm -hmm. is still staying to uh, your strengths and still staying with your principles. And, um, you know, if you have those pivot points on which you can pivot, then it's not that your passions are changing, it's that your passions are evolving. And that's where the logic and the reverse engineer comes into it, because you can see that it isn't a bunch of changes. It's an evolution of a life and hopefully a life, you know, uh, filled with passion and a life worth living and, and a life well lived. No, absolutely. I mean, and obviously, you know, the great analogy, obviously, from your flying, uh, because when, when you fly, you know, you say, OK, I'm flying from A to B and this is my flight path. But you've often got to adjust things as you go because of the circumstances. Course correct and always have an alternate airport. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, and, I, and I just and I did. And then the other thing I think today, Ravi, is that this is probably well, it is the greatest opportunity people have ever had, because taking aside a lot of roles that you, you know, you need to be physically there and do but for, certainly for knowledge workers and people like that is, I mean, today you can live anywhere in the world, you know, you can work, you can work remotely, you can find, there's so many opportunities for people now. And I think that's going to be, we're going to see in the future, most organizations are going to be hybrid organizations. And by that, I mean, they're going to be some people in offices, some people remote, sure. some people half and half. But also there's going to be full time employees, there's going to be long term contractors, there's going to be people who come in and out. It's going to be so much more fluid that I think the opportunities, if you want to set yourself up, uh, you know, as a contractor or something and do the thing that you really enjoy, you've got a greater opportunity now than you ever had. Yeah, I mean, in many senses, you know, we knew this before the pandemic that we were in a gig economy and moving into mm -hmm. it. Um, which is great for the freelancer, the independent contractor. It's sort of the, the, the script that we follow. Um, but uh, what we also realized through the pandemic, if not before, was the global opportunity because we saw this hybrid reality taking place. I mean, within the education system in schools, all of a sudden, uh, you know, everybody was online. And that quickly evolved into teachers saw opportunities to visit classrooms on the other side of the world or to have a visiting professor from the other side of the world. Um, students, uh, I started a program called Ravi Unite Schools some years ago where I take a classroom in the United States and, and have them talk for 45 minutes with a classroom in India. And they all realize that they have much more in common than they thought. And uh, you know, there are these incredible global opportunities now that enable us to take advantage of the uh, fluidity and flexibility that we have in a gig economy on a much grander scale. I will say though that the basic principles of business still have to be intact. And I think that it's very important that um, people develop structures, business structures, yeah. um, business plans that again, can they can shift, they can evolve, they should evolve, uh, but, and they should have some risk built into them. But uh, you, know, you need to have that vision and structure if you're going to be successful, even especially, especially in a gig economy, because you don't naturally have this, the corporate structure or the corporate ladder that you're gonna climb. So you have to kind of create it for yourself. Yeah, and there's always the danger that you fall into what I call the shortcut culture that exists today, where you know you're bombarded. Everything is made seem like it's easy, and it should be overnight. So it's not a question of like setting yourself up at Upwork as a con as a contractor and then kicking back and waiting for the the business to come in. Like life doesn't work like that. But I feel sometimes the pervasive culture right now kind of tells you that oh doing things the right way doing things the hard way oh that's silly that's that that's that's old that's so old school yeah i you know i to to throw in another cliche you know if, if it's easy it's not worth doing 
you know, in some senses, I think, you know, the, the hard work that you put into something, again, we, we've touched on many of these aspects, the hard work creates luck, right? So you got to put in the hard work if you want to be quote unquote lucky. Um, but again, it's also not about the destination. It's about the journey. So the hard work is part of the journey. And uh, Confucius, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life, right? So, <laughs> you know, you put all of that together. And at least to me, it sort of becomes pretty obvious that there's a formula here that can work, but it doesn't mean a lack of structure. In fact, I think it means more discipline and more structure, but not losing focus of, uh, of what the journey is about. Yeah, no, no, 100%. And, and I think that whole concept of managing yourself, I think that's such a key thing because you can, you're key. It's tempting to be very lenient with yourself when you're your, your own boss. Uh, so you have to, you have to watch out. You have to be very careful for that. And, and I think also, I mean, as, as you were saying is like, you know, it's great to have your, it's great to have your big goals and your big passions and everything. But I think sometimes we don't sort of just look over our shoulder for a moment to look at how far we've come. And I think that's something that times holds people back. They think, well, I can't do that or I couldn't do that. But if they just took a glance backwards, they suddenly say, actually, I'm quite creative. I'm quite resilient. I came through that situation. I did this. I think we have a wealth of experience sometimes that we overlook. Well, I think that's absolutely true. And, you know, my, my, as a keynote speaker, my primary audiences are educators because it comes back to education that has to prepare people to uh, succeed in unpredictable circumstances. And that means we have to teach them to pivot. We have to teach them to be lifelong learners. And, you know, that means we have to teach them how to fail and recover. And, you know, all of these, these types of skills that our current education system, which is very test focused, very uh, college uh, oriented, yeah. college and career oriented, doesn't permit those skills to be developed in what should be the safest environment at school to, to develop them. So for, th for those of us that weren't afforded that opportunity in school, I think we have to take it upon ourselves to say, okay, it's okay to take that risk. It's okay to fail. Fail, F-A-I-L, first attempt in learning. Remember that, you know, that's really what uh, the acronym means, to, what the word means to me in an acronym form. And I think it's very important that we allow ourselves those opportunities and realize that the more we do it, the more we can recover. It's not easy. I mean, I, I make it sound easy, I, I guess, but, but it does require uh, tenacity. It does require confidence. But the only thing that builds confidence is taking the risk. And so we have to take small risks that will allow us to build a little bit of confidence so that we can take bigger risks that will allow us to, to build a lot of confidence. Yeah, no, and I couldn't agree more. And I do lament a little bit here, you know, particularly in the in the States, but it's, it's kind of common, even at home. And that uh, is this idea that you have a singular path school to college. I mean, and it's and especially here, it's become so pervasive, you know, that oh, you have to have a college degree. And, and you're asking people at 16, 17 to like commit to these things and putting all this pressure on them. And a lot of people, quite frankly, the degrees that come out with, you know, it might have been a nice experience, not very valuable. There should be other routes for people. And I think that's that's the thing that really has come out of it is that we have to have multiple routes for people, not just one singular one through college. We do. And I think that's happening because if you look at the workforce, they're looking at these college grads and saying, well, they don't really know anything. So, <laughs> you know, we're going to have to retrain them anyways. So I think we're and I, and I think, again, to, during COVID, we saw this pivot to online. We saw people reevaluating the amount of money that they're spending on higher education and saying, you know, what is my ROI? What's my return on investment on this education? If my boss is telling me, well, the one I want to hire is telling me that I don't know enough to work for them. That's, that's what I paid for. So I think um, that the market forces, and in that case, I don't mean just the market as in the employers. I mean the student, right? Because the mm -hmm. student is the customer of today's higher education because it's all a big business. So the student, the client, the customer is going to say, no, we demand something different or we're going to find something different ourselves. And I think that's what's happening. And, and I think that's a good thing. I mean, it's a healthy... Um, checks and balances that will uh, change our higher education system for the better. Because ultimately, I've said it several times, uh, it's about lifelong learning. And so higher education is a part of that. It needs to be a part of that, but it has to be relevant. And in order for it to be relevant, it has to teach students the skills that enable them to pivot you know, throughout uh, their changing and evolving journey. 
Yeah, I know that's it's it's one area that seriously needs an overhaul. If you think about it, like the whole structure and of, of university and college courses, I mean, it hasn't really changed. It hasn't really changed that much. It really hasn't, and 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 but the world has changed so much, you yeah. know, and the world is changing in, in so many exciting ways that get that provide so many opportunities. So, um, you know, not not to knock, I, I believe in formal education. My desire, I'll tell you, it didn't work for me, and I left school um, to to pursue my music career. But my desire would be that it works for everybody, that there's a that there's a system in place that works for everybody, that so that I could confidently tell every kid. Hey man, you should be in school to some capacity for the rest of your life because that's a support system that's going to help you grow and evolve as you're also in the workforce or being an entrepreneur or doing whatever you want. It's it's part of being a whole human being and and part of the educational and life journey. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Listen, Ravi, this has been fantastic. All of Ravi's information is going to be below this video, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Yeah, so uh, I predominantly serve now as a keynote speaker and my main industry is in education. So uh, I give uh, usually opening, sometimes closing keynotes for medium to large education conferences, superintendents, uh, school boards, education leadership primarily. Um, and then also on the other side of that, I give uh, keynotes to organizations that are more entrepreneurial, things like the International Association of Home Staging Professionals was a recent um, a recent client and you know you think about how those people have to pivot uh as the needs i'm thinking of home staging and real estate you know you were talked at the beginning about this hybrid situation with people not going into the office that means the office is moving to the home which means yeah. people looking for homes are looking for different things than they were five years ago so everybody's got to pivot. So, so these are the types of things that I talk about with my audiences. Uh, my book, uh, there's two versions of my book, Pivot, one for educators uh, and, and parents, and the other for entrepreneurs and students. So a little something for everyone that uh, can take some of these tools, put them into action and you know, help them lead a successful journey ahead. Yeah, fantastic. And as I said, uh, all the information will be below this video. And I'd encourage you to go check it out. Go check out the books as well. I think this is a, you know, we've come through a bit of a nightmare period. And I know there's a lot of stuff still going on in the world. But I think the opportunities are going to start to unfold soon. We're in a, you know, with technology, with everything. And I think this is a great time yeah. now to start looking at, looking at maybe what you want to do. It's never too late. You know, you know the greater the challenge, is. the greater the opportunity, right? Exactly, exactly. Well, listen, thanks again, Ravi, and thank you all for watching and listening, and I'll see you all again very soon.